So what we're trying to do in our sterile lab space is to isolate one culture, meaning one strain of mushroom mycelium. And to do this, we need to limit the amount of other microorganisms that might want to use this agar plate, in this case, as a food source. And what that looks like, Jess can show you here. Some examples of some contamination. So this is what we do not want to happen. Um, and this normally happens because of uh, unsterile work protocols. So you can get green molds, which are the most common, called trichoderma. You can get these black molds. You can get bacteria, which looks a little bit more slimy. And that's normally from just uh, maybe touching your face or your phone while you're doing this work. So we really recommend that you use um, a sterile work surface that you can clean, smooth work surface like a metal table, nothing that is wooden or porous and that you use 70% alcohol uh, to spray your hands, your uh, clean either lab coat or clean shirt, clean clothes, um, your arms uh, and, your, and clean your work surface. So you can wipe it just using paper towel or you can just spray it and let it dry as well so the best thing to do with um, the 70% alcohol is to spray it wipe it or let it dry so that it actually has time to kill the bacteria or fungus or yeast and that way you avoid contamination. So that's another important thing, is to make sure that you use 70% alcohol rather than 90% alcohol, because 90%, which is quite easy to buy in the shops, is um, it evaporates too quickly. So it doesn't actually give it time to kill any of the microorganisms um, present on your surfaces. Pro tip. <laughs> So some of the other things that we have here in our lab, you may see that we have a lot of different equipment and materials and we're just going to walk you through what most commonly you will see in a lab space when working with mushroom mycelium. Having some gloves for protecting the skin so it doesn't fall into your, um, into your work surface. These can be either latex or nitro. Nitro. You can also use uh, rubber gloves. They're just less um, easy to work with, so you'll have less dexterity, which can get really tricky when you're working with very uh, delicate processes like agar to agar transfers. Um, but it's a way to keep a more sustainable lab practice. And also you can use uh, reusable, try to reuse your masks as much as you can. Um, you can spray these with alcohol once you're done with them and before you use them. Um, but yes, using proper use of mask is really important. And it's not because you will be breathing in these spores. It's, there's nothing um, that it's dangerous about this practice for you. It is again, like we said, so that you are not breathing the microorganisms from the inside of your nose, your cheeks, your face, your mouth, onto your plates. So we're protecting the mushrooms or the mycelium rather than ourselves. Um, some other um, tools and materials that you might find in the lab are aluminium foil. So we use this to cover uh, some of our samples or to cover uh, some, some jars, but to protect some plates if we're putting them in the pressure cooker. Uh, agar, which is a non-nutritious non uh, media, and um, we find this in cooking quite often. It kind of creates like a jelly-like material. Some syringes in case you want to create a liquid culture. Tape. So we use tape for um, labeling or to cover some of the samples when we're when we're working with the microcomposites. Important um, is a pen or a sharpie to be able to to document everything, metal spoons, inoculation loop. This is also used for bacteria transfers. If you're working with spores or spore prints, you might want to have one of these because that's the way that you'll be able to transfer those onto agar. Scissors for cutting aluminium, for cutting plastic, for cutting um, the tapes. Scalpels and fresh blades. Should we show how to? Yeah. So this is the proper use 
of a scalpel and this is how you would insert a fresh blade. So make, make sure that you get the right size. Important. And also just click it in, make sure that they're both at the same diagonal. And it should just slot in like that. If you keep it within the wrapper, it should be sterile. As soon as you remove it, you no longer have a sterile blade. Cling film or plastic wrap. Again, we use this mainly when working with the micro composites to so kind of cover it or protect it. Parafilm, this is a very interesting and special tape material. Um, we put it around our petri dishes mainly. And it's kind of like a plasticky tape, but that stretches and it allows the mycelium within it to breathe. However, it doesn't allow any other microorganisms to enter. So this is important to keep to, or to prevent um, any contamination from entering once your plates are transferred. Another thing to note is that we do use a lot of uh, plastics and a lot of things that are not necessarily sustainable so to try to keep the most sustainable practices in the lab space you can as we said like reuse your gloves reuse your mask as many times as possible have a lab coat that you can wash um, so that you can keep everything super sterile but you can also choose to use glass petri dishes for instance instead of single-use disposable ones um, because there's some things that you just can't help but need to use. I mean, if you get really good at this practice, it's possible that you don't need to use parafilm, but it's not really recommended. And just, you know, seal your plates with aluminum foil, which is also not recyclable. So it's important to minimize the amount of uh, trash that we are creating while trying to make more sustainable materials, right? So. This is very important because these are autoclavable, meaning you can re-sterilize them and you can reuse them infinite amount of times. Um, another thing that is in the lab space is all of our glassware. So aside from Petri dishes, we have our measuring flasks, which we use to make anything from liquid cultures to our liquid um, agar medium before we pour them onto our plates. Some recycled jars or mason jars. This we use to actually make liquid cultures as you see here. So this is to expand uh, any liquid cultures that we tend to buy in syringes like this. We would use this to expand and make just a lot more of this liquid medium so that we can keep reusing and uh, yeah, we can keep making new genetics with that. Another thing that you will need to use if this is in your practice is either some polyfill or we prefer to use these uh, micron filter stickers because again, just rather than using polyfill, which is synthetic uh, microplastic basically, we can use these little uh, filter stickers to also allow the oxygen exchange to happen inside of the jar. These self-healing rubber ports that you can also purchase and will allow you to make uh, really sterile transfers of your liquid cultures as once they're injected and you pull out the syringe, it actually seals right back up on its own. We also use a scale for measuring out and keeping detailed notes of the weight of our substrates and the weight of various nutrients and additives that we uh, put into our material mix. I think it's important to know also about the scale is that it, it's best if it goes to um, 0 0.1 grams. We don't have a laminar flow hood in this lab space, which means you don't need one either. They can be pretty pricey, especially if you're just starting out. It's an amazing tool to have if you have the means to either make one yourself or to purchase one. Um, it's a HEPA filter that blows clean air, filters out clean air, blows out clean air into your work surface and you can work right in front of it um, to be able to um, yeah, have a clean air and minimize any risk of uh, contamination or contaminants dropping into your work surface. But because we don't have that in this workspace, we work with a 
camping stove, so a Bunsen burner. So the Bunsen burner creates, well, the flame creates a convection current that, allow, that prevents any contaminants from falling above. So you basically have a Oops. sterile work surface uh, around a 10 centimeter radius around the Bunsen burner. And paper towels, of course, to wipe your surfaces, wipe your hands, wipe your plates. Uh, really important in our sterile lab workflow. Also, we use hydrogen peroxide, which kills bacteria and molds. So this is really good to even, you can add it into your agar or you can wipe your surfaces clean to make extra sure that all of the other microorganisms that are going to compete for the food source that you want to give your mycelium are completely gone. Sorry, microorganisms. What else can we show you in our lab goodie bag? So many goodies. So over here we have a pressure cooker. There's many different types of pressure cookers you can get. This is an electronic one. So the wonderful thing about this is you can put it on, set it to the time, and leave it for as long as it takes, and it will tell you when it's finished. So basically it brings it up to such a high temperature and high pressure that it, it's able to sterilize um, or kill any other contamination within the substrate or the, the agar that we're using. And each medium that we use has a different time that it should be inside the pressure cooker. So, for example, when cooking agar, you would do it for roughly around 15 minutes at, um, at 15 psi. So, 15 psi is the amount of pressure produced by the um, by the by the pressure cooker. And then, for example, with the grains, you would do it for roughly an hour and a half. And for the substrates, you can either pasteurize or, if you wanted to to sterilize the substrate as well you would do it for roughly like 80 minutes. So. so because of this particular machine not actually indicating how um, much of a PSI it goes up to, we've had to go an extra mile and, and, and leave um, both the agar and the substrate and the, um, the grains in for a double amount of time. So here you can see I have some of my notes. Um, experimenting with what, what has been working. So for example, uh, the grains have to be cooked at 180 minutes, which is three hours. Yeah. And over here, as we were talking about before, which is um, keeping the sustainability within the lab, we use a lot of distilled water. So we actually thought it would be more useful to buy, to buy a water distiller. A separate fridge to a food fridge. Here we, we store our cultures and on some of our substrate bags, especially during the summer because here it's really hot. So if we want to keep our cultures alive, we tend to keep them in the fridge whilst we're on holidays. Important to have in a DIY lab space is the sink because you're going to be washing things a lot, rinsing, cleaning, whatever. <laughs>